Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Design Cinema and this is Let's Draw episode 73 Final Fantasy 7 part 1. Yes, part 1 because there's no way we could fit an awesome game like this in a single episode so I've decided to split it up into two. So for this episode, the part 1, one we're going to focus on color comps and this will kind of break it up from the previous episodes. Uh, I'll show you guys a different technique and color comps is something that's done quite regularly in the industry. It's quite beneficial because it's fast. And and uh, as you can see in this one hour episode, uh, one hour episode uh, it's been compressed about three times in real time. This, these nine paintings took about uh, three hours to do. So that averages about 20 minutes per painting. So very, very quick. And if you are doing freelance, color comps are very helpful because your clients get to see what you're working on before they approve the final. And if you're in-house, your art directors could see what you plan to do for the rest of the day uh, by the time you hit lunchtime, right? So if you get in at 9 o'clock, uh, say three hours later, you got nine comps to show them uh, by, by noon. So you could get things approved and your afternoon is all set. So, okay, so what am I doing here? So I started with big canvas. I think this is about five to 6,000 pixels wide. And I simply just cut a couple of frames out of it by putting a black layer on top of a white layer and then just use the lasso tool and cut out nine frames. Now, you don't have to start with this many. Uh, for you guys practicing, maybe just start with two, three of them. Uh, but the whole point of comps is to have many, many versions because if you're doing just one, then that kind of defeats the purpose of having a lot of choices to uh, to pick from for you, from your clients or art directors. So I'm going to do a... Um, three comps per area. So let's talk about the game. All right, so Final Fantasy VII, this game is uh, definitely one of the most iconic games to ever hit the uh, industry. Uh, for those of you who are my age, uh, I'm, I'm mid-30s now, so uh, you could probably play this game. If you are in your teens, I'm not exactly sure if you guys play this game since uh, this game is right now, what, it came out in 96, so it's 17 years old. That's unbelievable. This game's been out for that long. So if you're in your teens and you haven't played it, I heavily recommend you guys to go pick it up. Uh, you can actually get this for, I think, PCs uh, as well. And uh, so yeah, check it out. It's an unbelievable one of the most perfect games I think ever produced with memorable characters, stories, environments, you name it, music, especially as you heard a little bit of it in the beginning. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and attack three of the areas that I personally liked a lot. Uh, one of which is the key starting point of the game, which is called Midgard. This is a build by the corporation, I think, Shinra, Shira, if not pronounced that correctly, I think. Um, but basically, it's a corporation that's mining uh, this area and turning everything around it into this kind of barren wasteland. Uh, this is a very iconic city. This is where you start off, in which... Um, I'm trying to remember here, it's been 17 years since I played this game, but I think, yeah, the Avalanche, was it the Avalanche? You start out as a terrorist group, uh, working for a so-called terrorist group, uh, blowing stuff up, you know, so against a corporation. Uh, so this area is very dense, it's completely corporate, it's got uh, mining facilities everywhere, pipes running through everywhere, and all run to a central core in which the elite, or the corporate, uh, the so-called 1%, right, lives and controls everybody else. So, uh, yeah, so that's one part. The second area, which I'm getting to right now, is uh, Rocket Town. I just loved this design. Uh, this is also built by the corporation uh, Shinra. Shira. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, but basically, they built this rocket. Uh, I forgot what's for, but it's being abandoned. And this is also where you meet a, a character which is persistent throughout all the Final Fantasy games. And his name is Sid. Uh, he's always uh, building airships. So I think Sid uh, started probably from Final Fantasy 1. I'm not sure, but it's always the, the airship guy. Um, in any case, he is from this town where you meet him, and there's this abandoned rocket that's kind of leaning about 25 degrees or or so uh, from center, and all around is this kind of quaint little town that's that's just left uh, kind of abandoned, still very cute, but uh, the rocket itself has been overgrown. Uh, it's got this kind of uh, you know nature versus uh, uh, man-made uh, objects contrast, which I loved a lot. So I'm gonna go ahead and. Uh, design that. And the third area I want to focus on is uh, Cosmo Canyon. Um, that place, I just remember, had one of the most beautiful music uh, ever. It's extremely iconic. You guys could probably go to YouTube right now and just type in Cosmo Canyon uh, soundtrack and you will you could get a snippet of the sound. It's absolutely wonderful piece of uh, orchestrated music and uh, it's great to listen to while you work, by the way. So 
So yeah, so right now I'm going to start with line drawings because this is going to be a two-part episode and I want to make sure that I get some nice designs in there uh, since i got plenty of time now to split up the thinking. Sometimes, you know, when you're doing spontaneous paintings, you don't have that much time to dig into the, the philosophy uh, of the design or the deeper core of the design. For this one, I wanted to uh, really hit that up, especially as we get into color and shapes. Uh, later, you'll see in this episode, I actually get into that and I'll discuss that with you guys as well. So since I'm still drawing here in the, uh, in, in the video, let's talk about this game a little bit more. So this came out. This game came out in 1996. Uh, I remember it very, very well because it was my first job. My first job out of Los Angeles. I was in Austin, Texas. This is the summer of '96. I got my first paycheck from Warjin. I was working on some of those. Uh, uh, what's a freelancer online which never came out uh, I was working on a team that uh, just finished Ultima online I think one of the premier MMO games that define all the other MMO games uh, well, I was doing a space version called freelancer online but anyways got my first paycheck went to Best Buy and Final Fantasy 7 just came out I bought the PlayStation 1 just for this game uh, went home turned it on and I don't think I went to sleep because it was on a Friday I picked it up and uh, I think I, I burned through all weekend playing this and went to work completely sleepy. Um, so yeah, it was a wonderful moment. This game is just really, really nice. Uh, creates so many good nostalgic memories. So let me jump back to the video here for a second here. So you can see um, I'm now writing notes. What I want to do is come up with a, a reason for the designs. Yeah. For Midgar, I want this industrial oppression feel. You have this 1% living above everybody else. They have all this heavy industry stuff, kind of oppressing all the poor. Uh, the people that's actually uh, trying to make a living, they're all kind of oppressed into the slums areas uh, in the game. Um, so I want two things. One, I want this heavy industrial structures to be rising above like pillars. And the colors of them are very, very cold. So I'm going to be most likely using cool grays and cool blues to portray the upper part of Midgar. Now, as we go down below, that's actually the heart of the city. That's where the real people, the people with feelings and, you know, the, the, the less cold type of people live. So I want to contrast that with much warmer color tones. You go into the kind of the warm lights, the fire colors, a little bit of orange and yellows, and that contrasts greatly with the cool blues from above. So, and the shapes are going to be all vertical struts. Everything's going to be cylindrical based uh, to play off the piping motif. Yeah. And, uh, so we're going to get play with that. So for Rocket City, I want to base everything off of a triangular form because I think that signals the rise upwards, right? Triangle forms the tip at the top. So that plays off the whole rocket aiming at the sky. And then in terms of colors, I really want to get this contrast of reclaiming. The earth is reclaiming this technology back to itself. Um, so the grass, the green, is going to start from the bottom and rise its way up into this rustic, red that I want to use for the rocket. So it's like everything's going back to nature and everything's going to be triangular based. For Cosmo Canyon, I'm going to focus on these pill shapes, uh, these dome shapes. This is a very, very natural environment. This, it's almost like the uh, going into the American Midwest, you know, where you have this nice desert -y kind of middle of nowhere and the stars is just shiny bright at nighttime. Uh, I want to create a cosmos feeling by, by having these round shapes because the, uh, you know, the, the uh, galaxy has these kind of swirly lines, uh, as you see me draw sort of there on the thumbnail there. And I want to use those lines to capture the feeling of this place and really get the high contrast that we're out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, in terms of colors, I want to stick with some of the purples that you see in the Midwest uh, during sunset and this nice hot orange that you get from the sunsets um, and of course we want to get some stars out because in the game uh, you actually stargaze there's like campfires you meet this uh, wolf tiger looking thing there called the uh, red 13 so I, I don't know what he is he looks like a dog but then he's got a lion face um, but you meet this great character and uh, again the music there is just incredible so here I am putting in color comp images uh, according to what I just told you guys uh, in terms of color I want to pick. So I'll just start with some photographs just to get the color kind of thrown in there. It's a fast process. Again, these are comps. Uh, they're not meant to be like, oh, this is the finished deal here. It's meant to be fast and we want to get our idea out as fast as possible. Um, speaking of fast, I should probably slow down while I'm talking. So sorry, uh, you know, why am I doing this so fast? Because we're extremely busy. I'm so sorry, guys, for the delay uh, for the new episodes. We've been just swamped for the past two months with, uh, you know, what do we do? We launched a new website for our school we came out with a book um, 
to what else have we done uh see a bunch of stuff i can't remember uh and also this is e3 season so e3 season is extremely busy on the freelance front because all the companies are out there the hiring concept guys do this and do that to uh to make projects so they can show at e3 so oh yeah another thing is uh one of the games i worked on called call of duty what is it called advanced warfare that's coming out at e3 so i spent about a year on that project and you guys could go check out the trailers just type in COD Advanced Warfare and you'll see the, some of the designs that uh, I've done for that game so anyway so yeah I've been really busy and I tried to squeeze this episode in uh, today this is Thursday I cleared it just for you guys um, so hopefully um, I'm not speaking too fast but I gotta get this thing done okay let's jump back so I'm using color comps here to save time or color palettes from photos to save time and what I've done is throw in the photo and apply a quick motion blur in the vertical space. So the motion blur pretty much just gets rid of the photos because I don't really care about what's underneath, right? I don't care what the subject of the photo is. I don't care if it's like a kid on a bicycle or, you know, uh, people on by a river washing clothes, which, you know, the upper right corner, you see that. The subject actually does not matter. What I want is the, is this color the mood I want? Uh, is it getting the feeling I want to capture? So the subject really is relevant. So by applying a blur, it gets rid of that and we could then focus purely on the color palette itself. Uh, speaking of kind of the feeling, when I started the designs for these, it was the same thing. Instead of getting uh, bogged down by small details like, okay, how should the rocket be designed or how should the building in Midgar look? What I want to do is design by value, focus on the overall feeling, right? Like for example, if I was to tell you uh, or describe to you New York City, uh, I don't think you're thinking about the door frames or the individual restaurant openings or the, a, a specific taxi shape. What you're thinking is density, people, the yellow taxi colors, uh, immense skyscrapers that, that rise up and you can barely see the sky. You know? tons of uh, things everywhere you know you look left you see people walking the street you see police officers you see all this stuff just just movement uh, when you look to your right you see buildings you see shadows you see sun rays you see sparkles of reflections I think that's what you know and noise right you hear all this noise uh, and I think that's when you, when you when you imagine New York that's what you see now if I was to describe to you um, let's think about the jungles of the Amazon well you think green 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 and dense green rivers uh, water but you're not thinking like the leaf you're not thinking like like a specific branch you're going for a density or volume plus feeling so during the early phase of a comp design i approach it the exact same way instead of focusing again on individual elements we focus on the value and what i'm being value what i mean by that is if you were to take this object and fill it with water how big of a space does it take so a for example a skyscraper in new york takes a certain value the value is much heavier than the volume for example of the people on the street the street on the value may be lower it's more squished the skyscraper takes up these huge chunks of value and you want to place those in first get those values balanced out get those volumes also balanced out and then later we'll go back and apply details so right now the color is being treated the exact same way Okay, where do I want the warm to be in Midgar? Okay, in the bottom, bottom one third of the screen, I want to be warm. And as we pull up, we're gonna go into the blues, and then we're gonna go desat uh, by by building in the cool kind of the uh, non-human uh, or warmth feeling uh, that I try to pursue for Midgar. So, yeah, you guys could try this too. So, you know, uh, let's follow along since this is a let's uh, draw. Maybe you guys could pick your favorite game and do some comps for it. And the idea here, though, is not to be sloppy. So comps, even though they're fast, isn't meant to be this quick, scribble together, sloppy thing. You still want to build it with accurate fundamentals, meaning that your horizon line, your vanishing points are somewhat okay. This way, if your comp is approved, you don't have to start from zero. You can simply just take these uh, paintings and just start painting right on top. In fact, that's what episode two uh, or part two of this uh, episode will be. So next week, uh, hopefully I get to it next week, I am gonna take probably three of these, you know, the three of the favor out of each column and we're gonna finish them up uh, by applying details. And I wanna record that entire process for you guys since a lot of you guys asked about, you know, how does detail work or how do you apply it? So I'll hopefully uh, record that for you guys and you'll see. So. All right, let me take a drink of water here because I've been talking 13 minutes straight without uh, without a break. Hold on one second. All right, sorry about that. Okay, I am back. Um, so yeah, so now I'm taking the color comps that from the photos that's overlaid below and now applying uh, your first pass of rough shape definition. So this is not details. This is just breaking forms out. So I've started with Rocket Town. Um, the water, I do these comps, which you can see I have nine of them on the same page. 
this is the way I like to work. I don't like to work with individual pieces. And for those who've been following design cinema, you probably see me do this quite a bit. I like to be spontaneous in my work mode. I don't want this perfect, like here's frame one, here's frame two, here's like uh, image number one, and kind of this mechanical approach. I like to have everything uh, all at once in front of me. So when I want to work on Rocket Town for a while, I'll paint Rocket Town for a while. When I get bored of that, I'll move on to Midgar for a few minutes and then maybe jump over to uh, to uh, Cosmo Canyon. So this way it's all in front of me. Uh, you're spontaneous looking at everything at one time. So you could uh, kind of jump back and forth without getting bored. So Rocket Town is the first one I approach. So here I'm using light, some light separation, some color separation, using what I got below to just pull out the big parts. So not focusing on details, not focusing on what exactly is the building design made out of. I will do that as we go back for another pass. What I'm gonna do here is work in sequ uh, sequential level of buildup. So one by one, all nine of these comps are gonna to start come together. So in this case, if a client or art director were to check on you at this point, the, uh, not this point, but you'll see probably within 20 minutes or so, all nine of these will become readable to a certain extent. Um, and then when I have more time, maybe another hour, you would go back and define some of the designs. So at that point, not only is it readable, the design is also starting to show up. And this whole process, again, takes just a few hours. And at that point, you can now get it, the uh, comps completely approved and you spend the rest of the day or the afternoon uh, finishing it just by doing uh, details. So, yeah, so, you know, it's a great way to try it. Now, in terms of the resolution, um, I think this pixel, I think I'm about 5,000, maybe a little bit more. I think it's about 6,000 pixels across. So each comp painting right now is about 2,000 pixels wide. And that's plenty for a comp. That's plenty uh, size to do. So I just thought of something. We just did, we just did a Squaresoft game, didn't we, with Chrono Cross. This is another Squaresoft game. So, of course, Square was at the height of its power uh, during the uh, RPG days in the mid 90s and I think early 2000s. I mean, they were just dominating whenever one of their games would come out. It's like kids would like ditch school. Do you guys remember that? Uh, to like line up in Japan to play Final Fantasy. I think they lost a little bit of that, uh, but hopefully they bring it back uh, as we as uh, we get into next gen consoles and stuff. So I think Final Fantasy 15 is coming out uh, one of these days, uh, which look quite interesting. A little bit of departure from their norm uh, with, the, with the graphics, but uh, maybe they'll do quite well. So never know. But uh, yeah, as a kid, I, I was in love with everything, anything square. Uh, I was just eating this stuff up because it was just such a fantastic experience that the uh, game developer takes you on, that you literally want to go home and just lose yourself in these games. And while I was painting these, I actually had the soundtrack up in, the, uh, in my ears so I could kind of get in the mood. And man, it was like hardcore nostalgic. You know, you start remembering uh, uh, like, oh man, I remember this town. I remember like buying this potion from this thing like you remember the the smallest little details um even though it's been like 17 years i still can't believe this game is that old um but holds up that extremely well if you play it today you know for those who haven't uh, played this game really seriously go pick it up you and, and give yourself a a good uh, long block of time you know start like friday night at eight o'clock and just blow through till saturday or something because you're gonna need some time to get into a game like this it's extremely long tons of characters you meet uh, the stories twist and twist uh, all over the place you know so but uh, really really good um, so yeah so now I'm on part two uh, the second uh, rocket town here um, so last episode I got a lot of good feedback seems like um, the some of the advice I give you guys on top of just the technical side was really helping some of you guys especially the younger ones getting started so I'll continue that with this episode just uh, reinforce the fact that do this stuff for yourself do drawings or do themes that you find fun. Don't worry about like, okay, this is mainstream, so we've got to do this or, you know, everyone on the internet is drawing this, so I should draw that as well. If you do, do stuff really well and you do it because you enjoy it and you do it to a very high technical level, you could probably find work in this business. It's not about always painting what's trending or painting what's, uh, what everybody else, you know, painting for the audience, essentially. You do this for stuff for yourself. Uh, for me, I love old video games. I love classic RPGs. So, you know, picking these games was a no-brainer. Um, you know, th this is completely up to you. If you like things that are very high, advanced technology kind of sci-fi cities, okay, paint those. If you like our, you know, old uh, medieval-type themes with knights and castles, okay, paint that. Uh, it's all about having fun. This business, if you want to get into it, is, is a lifetime commitment. And, uh, yeah, you, ha you have to keep yourself entertained for, for the rest of your life, you know, a good, at least a good 20, 25, 30 years, uh, you'll be drawing every day, uh, designing every day, working with clients and discussing design. And even now, I've been in this business for what? Yeah, 17 years, <laughs> you know, same year as Final Fantasy uh, 7, actually. Um, 
boy, that's a long time now I think back, but uh, I still get excited you know, when we get off the phone with clients. Just last week, uh, we're talking about this uh, IP. Still, still giddy as a kid, you know, still a 15-year-old kid when you get off the phone with these guys and still hard to believe that this is a, a real job in which, you know, you got clients on the phone telling you to design, you know, made up stuff. You're like, what, what kind of conversation did I, just, did I just have? You know, I'm a, a grown adult, but here I am talking about um, made up worlds and, you know, all sorts of stuff that the clients are kicking around that, uh, yeah, it's very enjoyable. Uh, you want to be able to keep that energy with you for, for a long time. If you start getting burned out or don't enjoy doing this anymore, um, then yeah, maybe it's not the right career. So you gotta, you gotta keep it fun. So, all right, let's go back to the paintings here. Now I'm on Midgar, uh, now flushing this out. So I want to keep the cool grace on top and a kind of a cool warm. Now, I don't want the warm to be as warm as Rocket Town. Rocket Town, I want to keep it very, very homey. I don't, I don't know that's the right word, but, uh, you know, it's like grandma's grandma's cooking. You know, that type of feeling is like you go home, it's like, ah, the sunlight comes in. It's really warm. You got the curtains. Uh, it's like the inns from Final Fantasy always felt that way. They have this kind of ray, light, ray of light coming in. It just felt so warm. And I want Rocket Town to have that. For Midgar, I still want to keep it cold, even though, there are warm lights coming from below. I want to keep the warm overall cool down. So the overall palette is still in a cool zone by toning the entire piece with a little bit of blue. I could hopefully keep that in a cool because I want this area to feel cold. It's an industrial zone. So even though there's a lot of life, there's a lot of uh, snippets of uh, uh, human humanity, I guess, uh, the dominance of the man-made machinery is still way overpowering. Uh, in fact, there's a great scene in this game, in which you meet uh, one of the key characters in a church, uh, go, you guys probably know that, uh, and the church had this hole in it, and the sunlight comes through the hole, uh, the rest of the church is completely dead, it's all gray, and Square designed this patch of uh, greenery, this green of flowers, uh, into where the sunlight could hit, and that was just absolutely beautiful, uh, and I think that plays well with Midgar uh, as a design element, that it, it is metallic, it is cement, it is raw, I mean, it is man-made, hard, cold materials and to have plant life is a very rare thing uh, so in this in these palettes I actually avoided green on purpose so everything is man generated there isn't anything made by nature here in fact this is stealing from nature right um, and Final Fantasy plays up that uh, that type of uh, theme very well uh, in fact a lot of Eastern uh, Eastern RPG games play off the whole uh, like earth is, is Gaia type of thing it has its own energy and uh, Bad corporations take that energy, therefore draining the uh, the planet of its life, and the planet then releases evil upon the humans. Um, so I think Final Fantasy follows that theme quite well, and Midgar is definitely at the center of that destruction, sucking the energy uh, out of the planet itself. Uh, Mako, is it? I can't remember. I think it's some kind of gas. They're extracting some kind of energy. I think it's Mako. If I'm not mistaken, uh, someone's gonna kill me. It's like you're a Final Fantasy VII fan. I can't remember the name, but uh, I ha yeah, I haven't played this game for so long, so I can't remember. But I'm surprised I still remember the uh, uh, the avalanche. I just somehow popped in, uh, popped in. Like Garrett, is it Garrett, the guy with the gun on his hand? So uh, yeah, you start as Cloud, uh, Garrett, and there's one more guy with you. I think he gets sacrificed later. I can't remember. Uh, but three of you run out of a train, go up and blow up something, set a bomb somewhere in one of the uh, sectors. So Midgar, I think, was divided into eight sectors if i remember so each sector is like a different uh, theme you got like the slums and uh, there's like some uh, market district and stuff like that so all right um let's see here let me check on time how much time am i in 22 minutes all right cool so this this will run for about an hour so we've got plenty of time we've got 40 minutes so let me slow down a bit and have another drink of water all right so hope you guys are enjoying these episodes um now E3 is coming up, so hopefully our schedule will lighten up. Also, school is over in terms of the terms. Um, tomorrow is the last day of school at our, at, the, at, the, at our school here. So hopefully next week I could finish part two for you guys. I mean, honestly, I really want to do design cinema all the time because they're a lot of fun. Uh, they're free form, and I know that the, they inspire a lot of you guys out there so they're the motivation behind them is extremely strong it's just that finding the time to do these is just it's, it's so hard you know i'm working the, from like 10 to 10 to 9 some pretty much every day actually uh, you know we're putting crazy hours at, at work here um, but uh, i want to stop that for a while it's getting pretty tiring so uh moving to next week hopefully i could uh, go home at seven o'clock and uh spend next thursday on the part two all right, getting a little repetitive here. Let's talk about something different. Um, no layers. These are all done in 
just one layer essentially. Uh, I do use dodge a little bit, the dodge brush, when I do the highlights. But uh, other than that, it's all done one layer. Again, to keep the organic nature going, instead of having like nine different layers or something for each of these comps, I just kept everything on a single canvas. Later, I will turn off the black border layer that's separating all these. And you'll see that underneath, it, it kind of looks like a traditional painting, which I love. I love that kind of feeling of organic uh, mixed in with uh, this technical stuff. So it gives you a little bit of a traditional look. So, all right, so this is the third make art. Let's talk about design. Let's talk about what the, uh, what the goal here is, because ultimately we have to finish all three of these, or at least pick uh, one of each to finish. So this is the outskirts. So I kind of divide it into three different sections for make art. The top one, is uh, is the financial or I guess the entertainment district. So what I want to do there is put the shops, the the various weapon stores, and you know kind of a lot of lot of things on sale, little inns, markets, weapons shops, uh, little factory things. So that's gonna be the top one. The second one is kind of your midway out. You're kind of the second ring, I guess, uh, of Midgar, and you're kind of having an overview above of what the city looks like. You're getting the cold piping. Uh, infrastructure that's on top of Midgar. The third one, you're on the outer ring. Uh, I think in the game, this will be the slums area. So this is the pores of the poor. These guys are living way out there on the outskirts of the city and the color palette completely dies down. So as you can see, the entertainment district still has a warm, cool contrast. The second one is starting to go gray warm. The third one, I'm making the gray very, very depressing. So there's not that much hue left in the colors. The gray is starting to go pure. So this way I could keep this area looking very, very poor. So this is where like the beggars and the homeless and the, those type those type of uh, individuals live. They're all being kicked out of the city. So I want to make this into almost this kind of abandoned uh, uh, part of Midgar. Um, for Rocket Town, uh, all three are pretty similar. The top two are more closer to the uh, design that came previously uh, in the, in the game. Uh, in the original game, there's only about five houses. It's not even really a town. It's more like five houses uh, surrounding a rocket. Um, if we're gonna uh, actually, I never talked about what, what a remake will be. Uh, I don't think if this is a remake, we will completely make the game into like some kind of like third-person adventure, Mass Effect-looking game. I think keep the game exactly the same, but maybe um, introduce a few more uh, areas in the game for you to walk around so the world could feel bigger. Uh, I'm not sure. But the approach for Rocket Town is that I want to make it a little bit, little bit bigger. So it's more than five houses. It's actually a town, and it's been really just left behind, abandoned. The space program has been... Uh, uh, just left there for the last uh, who knows how long, uh, you know, maybe a few years at least. And the plants have taken over and everything is rusted. So I want to get that uh, very earthy colors. So you're dealing with warm browns, warm greens, warm yellows, uh, earthy tones. For the uh, cannon, cosmic cannon, purples play a big role to get that nice Midwest contrast. And the uh, the lighting is really important for Cosmos. I want to almost like a dream light, uh, dream like. Uh, kind of lighting because here is where um, oh man I can't remember I'm sorry if I can't get this right but I think you you talk to that girl Tifa here uh, sitting on a like, like on a ledge and looking at the stars really good uh, kind of a love or a romantic moment, I, I think. I'm not sure it's from this game where I just saw some picture somewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, you're looking at the stars, the kind of the Lion King Simba, you know, looking at the star type of thing where you're reflecting on life. And Cosmo Canyon is a perfect location for that. So for this drawing, I want to capture that magical feeling that just the sun just set off the horizon, the moon is up in the air, you get a lot of these beautiful um, Milky Way type of star formations in the air. Just this magical um, feeling. Uh, it's also very natural and you're middle of nowhere. It's, you, could, uh, you, know, you could hear coyotes and th those type of things. So, um, so yeah, so that's the approach for Cosmo Canyon. I did three versions. The top one is sort of a uh, nighttime scene or video game nighttime, so it's not pure dark. Uh, you can still see the canyons are still red, but the sky has turned blue and going to nighttime. And later I will be applying the moon and stars. For the middle piece, it's more of a sunset shot in which it's a stabbing shot of the um, the cannon. You'll see the cannon uh, in the middle. Later, you'll see that happening. Um, and then it's kind of surrounded by a little bit of greenery. Just bring a tiny bit of green to uh, bring some life to it. And the third one is a dramatic lighting approach in which we take the sunset and hit one of the cliffs uh, big time on the left side uh, to create a high contrast uh, palette. So... Now the point of all these color comps is to separate the areas out and you can see here by turning the line drawings off you can see that the Midgar, Rocket Town and Cosmo 
Canon all, all have their own individual shapes and individual color palettes and lighting. So this way the players will experience exactly the same feeling as they travel across these areas. Um, designing for these kind of games in which we we as in terms of developers could control the lighting and the area is actually a little bit more easier, I guess, than say an MMO in which lighting is persistent or uh, you know it has day night cycles, then we cannot control when a player enters a certain area. Uh, that could create issues. You know, like you want to you want the player to enter a huge castle right at sunset, you know, get the epic sunlight behind the castle. But in a in a uh, I shouldn't say MMO, but in an open world sandbox game, you have no idea when the player is going to enter that castle. They could enter midday, horrible lighting, noon, you know, so there's no dynamic anything, and then discover they discover this heavy, you know, awesome epic scene. But it's not as epic if the lighting was better. Um, but in these kind of static games, uh, we could definitely control the colors uh, because nothing changes. You can stay here for 20 hours and it'll still stay the same in terms of lighting. So, uh, so yeah, here I'm working on the second piece here, so you can see. Uh, more of a stabbing shot, a little bit more cartoony. Uh, again, we're dealing with a light-hearted game here. This is not a photo real type of game, and I, ho I hope even there's a, if there is a remake, yeah, the game never goes into f sort of a photo real. I prefer the much cuter, cartoony, almost childlike approach of Final Fantasy VII, um, because Square did make Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, which is a animated. Uh, show uh, you can look it up on YouTube. It's probably available. Um, they went with a very realistic, almost a Final Fantasy X or nine kind of look. Personal preference, I much prefer the cuter version. I like Final Fantasy VII. I like Final Fantasy IX due to its cartoony take because I just think that it works better for the for the world. It, you know, it has the childlike quality, especially the uh, the adolescence kind of the first time in love with a girl. You know, this kind of thing. It just looks more innocent when when everything's are cartoony. Uh, I don't know. The, the the more realistic approach that Square is doing these days uh, doesn't appeal to me as much as the uh, as the uh, the cuter version. So I know my friends at Square are probably listening. So <laughs> I love your games, man. So they're gonna be like, "Fan, what the hell, man." Um, anyways, okay, so the third uh, third one here is the uh, dramatic lighting in which we're going to hit a nice orange uh, uh, piece of light onto that uh, rock on the right side. I need to take another drink. I'm talking way too fast. All right. This is me. This is Fang uh, on, on a high-stress week. So, But mood-wise, still good. It's all fun stuff. Um, you know, E3 is around the corner, so some of the stuff we worked on is going to be shown. Um Things are doing well. Our students did really well for the last term. Uh, our new website. So, if, you know, I don't want to pimp stuff on this site, uh, on this video, but uh, go check out our website. It's pretty cool. It's got a brand new format. Uh, that's the school website. Uh, much easier to navigate. And our book is on there. So just look under the tab Entertainment Design. And the book features a bunch of our students' work uh, as well as uh, our instructors as well. So, uh, okay, enough advertising because I want to. I don't want to spam you guys. Like, dude, Fane's advertising on Design Cinema. It's about, it's about you guys, right? It's about the videos. So... Now, uh, we have plans, though, for DrawCrowd, which is the other website that we, uh, we launched a few months ago, to allow you guys to attach images uh, into a group. So that's coming pretty soon. And uh, when that's up, hopefully we could then do design cinemas together. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll feature the episode on top, and you guys could draw along, and whatever file you guys produce, drawings, paintings, whatever, upload it. And we all could draw together. So it's kind of like this nice collaborative effort uh, and see everyone's work. You know, it doesn't matter if you're amateur, pro, it doesn't matter. It's about sharing with one another. Uh, even if you never drew before, all that stuff could be shown. There's going to be no like, like to censor this thing out or take because you're not a professional. doesn't matter because we all start from zero, right? We all start from drawing a shaky line on the piece of paper. And by persistently practicing and following uh, people that inspire you, and uh, keep going and uh, be dedicated, you will get better. I mean, there's no other way around it. So, um, so yeah, we all start from somewhere, and I want to have a place in which we can all share our art uh, without having to fear that, uh, you know, one is someone is better than you. Okay, here you can see on the video, uh, I took the black frame out, and so all these are done on the same layer, and, yeah, it's got this kind of cool traditional look. All right, so now moving into second phase of color comps, which is not finishing these, but now applying a little bit more detail about uh, maybe 30 percent or so on these so the art director types uh, or the producers could start seeing the actual design not in terms of detail but in terms of say architecture or exactly what they're looking at because right now it's still very very suggestive um, even at the end of it it's still going to be pretty suggestive but we're going to go from 100 percent suggestion to 
uh, I don't know, 60% suggestion, right? So you can, you can see a little bit of definition. Uh, and then our task for next week is to get it to, you know, 90, no, 10% suggestion, right? We're going to define 90% of it. So right now we're still dealing with uh, playing with a mental game here, but uh, definitely adding some details. So I'm using textures again, um, not for the uh, graphics, but more for colors. So I, I even blurred these images as well, as you can see, just to grab some secondary color tones into the picture. Uh, without having to kind of uh, uh, sample it from elsewhere. Just, you know, slap it on there. Does it work? It works. Okay, continue painting. Yeah. So here I'm starting to start defining the triangular, pyramidal type buildings. The original Final Fantasy, blah, Final Fantasy VII had these kind of very European looking homes, which I think is not that bad. But uh, let's play up the theme a little bit more. You know, I think Sid, uh, trying to get into his character here, the guy who's supposed to pilot this rocket, you know, the corporation canceled his project and sort of stuck here. Uh, I think that he'll be kind of depressed, maybe um, kind of just living out his uh, engineer life. This brilliant uh, airship commander pilot is kind of just stuck in this town. And maybe they don't do keep the upkeep that much. So things are starting to just get overgrown. The rock is abandoned. There's like rocket parts here and there, fueling pipes, uh, tubes, kind of just left there and grass and flowers are growing everywhere. And this, that's kind of the mood I want to capture here. Um, so have these triangles rise up a, a, above the sky, I think creates a nice, uh, the feeling of hope, you know, like one day this will rise back up or I don't know, that's, at least that's my attempt here uh, to get a little bit of a design language going for, for Rocket Town. Uh, and then of course, in the background, you always have this uh, rocket, shifted uh, kind of like the tower of pizza uh you know shift about 10 15 degrees off axes so um in the game I actually get to launch it later or oh, i don't want to spoil it for those who never played it but uh, yeah, yeah actually this rocket uh, i have no idea how they get it get to work and uh, if they launch it it doesn't burn the entire town up from his blast but uh, it's a video game so who cares right maybe it's using maple maple magic so all right, so this one you can see the uh, the left buildings again defined. It has these triangular windows. I'm trying to play off some of the forms from the original. It's these European looking buildings with uh, these attic kind of uh, uh, windows on top of the roof. So I play off the same design cues as the original. This part is pretty fun because now you're at a stage in which stress is much, much lower. Um, all nine comms are pretty much there. And of these nine comms, I think a few of them are working quite well in terms of pr taking it into a full uh, finished painting. So then the pressure is gone, right? And I, I just talked to this about our students, uh, you know, to, to our students here just two days ago about not producing, in t uh, producing yourself into a corner, meaning that um, say you want to do five, well, let's just say three drawings. You want to do three drawings. And you start with drawing number one, and you start drawing the details, the eyes, the nose, and you just focusing all your energy on this single piece of drawing, and the clock is just going tick-tock, 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 one hour goes by, two hours goes by, three hours goes by. Now, is there something wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with it. You can make, you can work that way. But uh, by the fourth hour, fifth hour, maybe your drawing's coming together really well, and it's looking good. However, your energy level has probably ran out. But if you're working in a production pipeline, guess what? The other two images are still due. You can't tell the clients, oh, I'm tired, so I'm not going to do the other two. Uh, if, they, if they commission you for three paintings, you're going to have to deliver all three. So now the second and third paintings are going to take a hit. They're going to take most likely a design hit because your brain is overworked. You, you spend too much time thinking about your first piece. Um, and you're going to take a physical hit. That means your hands are tired. So you probably don't want and don't want to spend another, you know, 10 hours detailing. So my advice here to our students always spend the energy on the design, thinking, and plotting first. So get it all out of the way because once they're out of the way, then it's just mechanical energy. You know, your brain could now take a rest. For example, I'm doing this phase here. Um, you, you could shut off quite a bit of your thinking because now it's just detailing. It's You, you got the overall thing defined. Uh, we're not doing anything super complicated at this point. We're not doing extreme high details right now. So you kind of relax and just let your muscles take over uh, and rest your brain. And you could do this for a good few hours without getting tired. And then, you know, go have a break, have a lunch uh, or whatnot and come back and uh, do the uh, clean detail stuff. So plan your production in a in a efficient way, uh, working one two or three could be a uh, could get you in trouble so again that's personal advice um, there's nothing wrong with working any way you can if if you produce good work and you have the energy to do so um, then then go ahead you know so it's all it's all good this is just my method from school so, so, so the school i went to 
just serious amount of homework. You know, it's always like 10 things to do tomorrow and then you know, 15 things to do tomorrow. And that's just for one class. You got like about four classes. So every night it was just like 10, 15, 10, 15, every single night, including weekends. So you, you start to come up with these pipeline solutions to produce. Um, now you can always argue well, in, the, in a perfect world, shouldn't we have all the time in the world to design everything? Shouldn't the client give you like, oh, we want the best design ever. So we'll give you plenty of time. Unfortunately, the world doesn't work that way. Uh, clients want stuff designed really well, and they want it within a day. So that's that's generally how it works. Um, it's a competitive business, you know. These big game games and films all, all have deadlines, and they have to release within a certain type of uh, uh, zone, you know, for E3 or pre E3 or pre Christmas. Uh, these are time time slots in which games want to get released at so uh, they set their deadline like three years before you know the, the, the first day you get to work on it sometimes the deadline's really been set so they want these things quick they want it fast and they want to look good so uh, yeah having pipeline uh, in your workflow is very very um, helpful so all right what are we 40 minutes in i got 20 minutes uh, with you guys so I uh, hope you guys are drawing along as well. Ho have Photoshop open um, and listen to this. I do the same thing. Uh, I don't listen to you know uh, uh, work stuff though. I listen to uh, mostly science stuff. If you guys want something else to listen to besides my my boring voice, um, check out a couple of things. I recommend um, uh, these are my personal favorites. Uh, Start Talk Radio with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, just awesome, awesome show. Uh, look them up on Start Talk Radio. Uh, it's got a bunch of episodes now. They're very interesting, really good to listen to while you work. Uh, the other one will be Radio Lab. Uh, again, it's very similar. Uh, talk about science-based uh, things, topics. You know, really, really bizarre stuff uh, that, that you generally don't normally uh, hear about. You know, just they just pick the most randomest topic and then go spend a whole hour talking about it. Uh, and the last one's This American Life, which I listen to quite a bit. It's not science-based. It's more uh, people-based shows uh, but i've been listening to that show for man forever so probably uh since the early 2000s man like 2001 or something i've been listening to that show it's been running for for a long time um so they got uh, hundreds of episodes for you to pick from it's ira glass uh show uh npr so um yeah lots of stuff which is about human just kind of keep keep the noise level and you know you hear, you're hearing a story essentially and stories keep you interesting and the way they produce it is, uh, is really really well done uh gets, gets you into the mood gets you into the story so yeah those are the kind of the primary shows i listen to uh while i work uh if there's no no new episodes from those guys i generally listen to like bbc documentaries on uh, on youtube uh there's plenty of those as well where any doc documentary you know war animals nature science uh they're all good they're all good for learning and they kind of just again keep the noise going uh, while you work so you don't concentrate too much so for those who are new to that uh, to my design cinema i mentioned before that uh, when i'm working in a complete focused state I actually tend to do worse work, you know, worse than what I generally do, at least. Um, but uh, yeah, I like to be distracted a little bit. So that way the spontaneous or instinct side of, of, of the brain takes over some of the work. So that way you're not detailing thinking like, oh man, this, uh, for example, like a river, a stream, a rock, a piece of plant. These are organic things that uh, you almost want your instinct to do versus like, oh, I'm gonna go paint a rock now, I'm gonna paint a perfect stream. Well, when you slow down to that extent, you can actually make it too tight, too stiff. These are natural things anyway. So you want your the, the, the curves and the energy in your body to almost generate those naturally. So if I'm concentrating, I'll do like the worst natural stuff. But you're, you're kind of spontaneously drawing uh, plants and mountains and stuff. Uh, it kind of comes on its own and uh, you get a better result. So that's why I like to have noise around when I work to keep your brain like half focused on something else. Yeah. All right. So... It's going to be pretty fun. I think next week we're going to choose one um, of these. Um, let's talk about the game some more, man. There's a lot of technical stuff because these things are meant to inspire you guys to have these open on, on your monitor while you guys paint. So let's just talk. Let's let's ramble on something else. Um, I always I wonder from you guys, you know, if you have to, because uh, this morning when I was trying to think, okay, what game do we do? And Final Fantasy VII comes up a lot uh, in on YouTube as well as my Facebook. So I go, hey, let's just do it. But, uh, you know, if you guys were to pick like, say, three games right that you, you have to take to like some deserted island for the rest of your life you know I, I often think about that it's like what what three games would i take what i could play forever on the island till you know till you die of old age you know so i have two for sure the third one i don't know so my first one will be fly sim you know, because i like flying airplanes and not 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 even the newest fly sim i actually like fly sims uh, microsoft flight simulator 9 um 
because there's just you can always learn something new. There's so many planes available for that thing. It's a very geeky thing, you know. Uh, that's just the geeky side of me. So, anyways, number two will be Civilization. I want to say four, but five is really good with the newest DLCs and patches. I think it'll probably be Civilization Five because that game is endless. You can play that game till the end of time, and it's still entertaining because every game is different. Uh, so those two are my kind of uh, never end type of games. The third one, I have no idea. I, I don't know yet. It's it maybe it's an open world game like like Fallout or maybe Skyrim or something. But uh, even those games, I, I think you can't play those for ten years and not not you know not do everything. So I don't know. Um, so yeah, I wonder what you guys are saying in your channels. What you know, three games don't cheat because whenever you run these things, it's always like okay, my three RPG games, and then here's my three first-person games. Like if you literally had to only take three games with you, uh, it could be PC, it could be console, what would it be? Because maybe we'll pick, um, you know, see if there's some kind of trend happening, and then maybe we could do a less draw using the top uh, top contestants. I think it'd be quite fun. So, but yeah, don't don't cheat, man. Don't list different categories. Like if I'm in a good mood, these are my top three, and if I'm in a violent mood, these are my top three. And it's like it's kind of like yeah, just three. That's it. No 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 different list topics of three. Okay, so I'll try to think of the third one by the next next episode what that will be. So. All right, let's go back to this because I, I imagine most of you guys are gamers and video game is really really cool these days oh man how time changed man when i was around in 96 97 you know when this game came out final fantasy 7 um being in the gaming industry is actually still seen as pretty geeky you know like you go to a restaurant it's like oh what do you do it's like i work in video games like oh man that nerd you know so you know say like oh i'm a i'm a you know i'm a doctor i don't know so you know it's like embarrassing you know uh, back in the days um but now things have completely changed video game is now extremely uh mainstream you know uh look at all these youtube channels with guys who just do let's play videos that has like millions of followers uh definitely wasn't like that uh, when i was around it was uh it was like a niche thing uh you don't meet anybody from the gaming industry you know like none of my friends were uh in the game store mostly in films uh, uh and uh you know costume design things like that i think there was like few dudes out there uh working on games and now you got like hundreds thousands of uh, concept guys out there working in the video game industry but it's fun it's really cool and uh if you guys enjoy playing games and join then the, you know it's it's definitely a fun business to be in but uh, it is a lot of work though so it is not a uh, you know the grass is always greener type of thing where like oh man it must be so fun to work on video games all day and it is it is a lot of fun but uh, it is also a lot of work and heavy heavy amount of stress because at the end of the day we're not making art we are making products so when you're making products that means deadlines money uh, you know you're dealing with producers you're dealing with all sorts of different people on the pipeline and everybody has to have their hands on your designs so you have to learn how to deal with stress uh, personality uh, things uh, teamwork all sorts of things but uh, but at the end of the day yeah definitely uh, one of the best jobs I think um, uh, you could probably do it's really really fun and it's extremely rewarding uh, I think um, the reward for me when I was younger was the kind of the, just making the image. But as you get older, the reward becomes like, man, I'm entertaining people. You know, I'm, I'm making, I'm putting a smile on on somebody's face, uh, and that is extremely rewarding. When you go to a like a shop like Best Buy or something and see these like 12 year old kids sitting on the floor with their Xbox or PlayStation and playing something that you helped design, and th th that is extremely rewarding. So uh, you know, bringing a smile to someone's face. Uh, what else can you ask? You know. So um, yeah, hopefully you guys uh, find that interesting as well okay so this is the second pass i'm kind of jumping around here i, I spent uh the time doing the three rocket city ones or rocket town and now i'm working on midgar fixing up so you can see it's a little bit more defined right you can see some of the buildings you can see some of the architecture but definitely not defined to the point where we are seeing architecture and furniture and exact materials those will be for next week and i'll try to spend uh, quite a bit of time with each of uh, of these images by putting in textures, uh, fine level of details, that sort of thing, so you guys can see how we could literally start from zero uh, at the point of this video, and we go to a hopefully presentation level production painting by next week. So, uh, and yeah, and there's there's not much to it. I mean, this is a pretty standardized uh, uh, pipeline in the business. Um, but not all companies do do comps like these. Uh, depends on where you work. Now, if you're working, for example, animation studios, comps are done all the time, and they're more like color key comps. And uh, if you have a good grasp on colors and composition and mood, uh, you can also get yourself in that business as well. So not just limited to games and films. Uh, animation tend to do a lot of color comps because for them, it has to also play with story and mood, and uh, you know what. Do they want the audience to feel at a particular point in the in the show, and those are controlled uh, oftentimes by color. 
so you know like blue for depressed red for fear and uh, you know kind of uh, green for happy sunlight those type of things so especially if you watch like disney or pixar films and uh, if you take screenshots every say 30 seconds and then split out the entire uh, line of the colors from the film you will see a color path goes across the entire uh, movie and it's quite fun to see and you'll see that in real life as well if you visit disney they oftentimes take a long hallway somewhere and uh, print out uh, all the color keys in the sequence they are shown in the movie and they kind of run this thing down the entire length of the hallway and i even seeing uh, mood charts underneath them like kind of like heart heartbeats in a way or were excitement charts like uh, you know like these peaks uh, like a music note and they'll actually graph that underneath the color keys to show here's what the audience most likely will feel and here's they get nervous here they get excited here they feel really sad because their hero's down and out and here's the starting of act three and you can see the mood rise up so it's quite fun but a little bit different than what I'm doing here. Uh, these are more comps for, for a production painting. Uh, for color keys, it gets a lot, little bit more deeper than what I'm doing here. So uh, that, that really plays with color theory. You know, uh, what, what the right type of orange, you know, the right type of green will kick off this type of feeling. So uh, yeah, definitely a little bit more involved than what I'm doing here. All right, what are we here? Okay, 10 more minutes left, cool. Um, so go ahead and continue leaving your comments uh, in Design Cinema. We, we definitely read every single one of them. So I apologize, this is probably one of the longest delay I ever had uh, on Design Cinema. So I'm like, dude, I can't do that anymore to you guys, man. I gotta, I gotta get this series going. So, you know, it just bug bothered me, man. You know, on Facebook, it works. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm probably, you know, making myself get a bunch of mail as a result of this. But, uh, you know, if you guys starting to see like, oh man, fame's been slacking off too much, man. Just, just, post on my Facebook wall somewhere or send me a bunch of messages like, dude, where's Design Cinema? Because that, that does help, you know, it, it shows that, okay, there's people out there waiting for for for, for the show and uh, the, the every day I put it off, I'm, I'm, I'm making someone not happy. So, you know, I, I want to make this work for you guys. So just just bother me with those kind of things. And it's not bother, just uh, send me these reminders, I, I, should, get, I should say. And uh, when I get enough of them, I go, dude, all right, all right, all right, Thursday or Friday, I'm clearing my schedule for you guys. So, um, Let's see, what else? Technical stuff, this is pretty straightforward. Next week, we're gonna get into texture work and I'll try to explain to you a bunch of stuff. I wanna get into brush, how to make custom brush. I wanna get into how to use textures, how to source for textures. Um, I'll also give you guys a bunch of uh, websites that I visit for finding reference material because I noticed there are some of you guys asking those questions. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I've seen a couple of uh, messages on YouTube as well as my private uh, inbox on Facebook, people are asking for my reference library. Um, dude, that thing is huge, man. I can't upload that. And two, those images don't belong to me anyways. They're reference images, they're other people's work. So, you know, for your own use, okay. But put, for me to upload it somewhere, that's not cool. Uh, and also, though, I think I got probably a few terabytes of references. So, uh, you know, there's no way you could uh, upload them. And secondly, you know, to, to be a proficient designer, you should be doing your own stuff, right? Look for your own references. Um, this is not a hand-holding business. You know, even if you get into a company, they're not going to give you anything. It's like, draw us this cool thing. They're not going to be like, here's this and here's that, here's this. You know, very rare. You're going to have to have your own reference library. So there's no need to like, uh, you know, put your hand out there and go, please give me this, please give me that. Uh, that stuff doesn't help you at all. The best thing to do is go out, be proactive and find your own reference images, make your own brush, you know, find your own pipeline, find your own way of painting because that's how you develop your skills by getting things for free from other people or getting handouts like give me your reference or give me your colors. Actually, sometimes that can make it harder because the other artists most likely made that stuff themselves and through years and years of uh, you know, uh, experimenting between wrong, what's wrong, what's working, what's not, and they find the best solution as a result. Now, you pick up their end result, you might not know exactly why they chose to work this way, why they choose to do it this way, because that's their own pipeline, right? So, you know, the same thing with personal style or drawing styles, it's the same thing. You know, it's not about, oh, I want to paint like this artist, so I'm going to try to emulate him as much as I can and do a bunch of fan art off his art. Instead, just paint what you want to paint personal styles come exactly that word personal you know you develop it on your own um, the more you draw the more you paint you start to find these certain waves of doing brush certain ways of doing your penmanship and over time say five ten years down the road you will define your own look so because you ask these guys like say mobius um, or um, wonky menace right these guys with very distinct uh, style sid me is another one you ask me how did you come up with your style I i'm sure the answer is like there we didn't we just drew you know we just drew a lot and uh, as a result these things come about by themselves so um 
my advice for you guys is the same thing. Pick up that pen, pick up that marker, pick up the Photoshop, and just do fun stuff. Um, of course, follow fundamentals. Fundamentals is important. You know, know your anatomy, know your know your basic perspectives, know your compositional rules, uh, lighting, color theory, and those things, uh, because those things are are pretty important. You know, you start to go outside of the realm of fundamentals, then you start to deal with uh, subjective. Uh, art pieces you know we again work in production and we have to make sure that uh, none artist types appreciate what we do not in terms of our art but understanding what we're trying to sell so when you get too quote unquote artsy uh, on your stuff you might not appeal to everybody else so fundamentals is a very uh, simple way to allow your work to be understood by those who are not from our industry Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. It's not about like, oh, you have to know these things because that's the rule. But yeah, it's it's important. You know what I'm saying? These rules are there for a reason. Uh, if you start looking at Hollywood films or how video games are made, they all pretty much follow the same formula. And it's not because we want to follow a formula. It's because that's how the human brain works. If you want something to look far away, you know, use atmospheric perspective or, or shape repetitiveness. There's these certain rules. You know, you want something to feel huge. You want something to feel small. There's certain camera lenses you use, certain camera perspectives you use. These are things we do to make the audience understand what you're trying to convey so and you apply the same rules and that's what fundamentals are you know if you think of perspective that's nothing but a camera you know, a camera is your eyeball so it's either your eye sees it or, your, or the camera sees it and that's all fundamental really is you know and uh, if you want to light something then understand how the light light rays work how does it hit an object how does it bounce those are all just exactly what a human eye or a camera will pick up anyways so uh, so these are coming to an end here and this is my last uh, almost second to last uh uh, Cosmo Canyon drawing here. So making a little archway like you have in Utah or Nevada. They have these kind of uh, uh, arch created by water and wind over millions of years. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to add that into Cosmo Canyon here to give that age look. And there's an observatory on the very top, this dome, very iconic building from the game. Very cartoony though. Actually, Final Fantasy, if you look at the game, uh, Final Fantasy VII, that is, the designs are kind of all over the place <laughs> if you actually play it. Uh, it's got like realistic looking places and it's got like extremely cartoony looking places. And they have like cars and have swords. It's kind of all over the place. But I think in a way, it's very magical as a result. You know, because there's even a place called like Coast of the Soul or something like that, right? Like this beach town. And it looks like something from straight out of Earth. You know, it looks like, it looks like uh, uh, some, some uh, vacation spot that you see, see in the Yucatan Valley in uh, Cancun, Mexico. Mexico or something like that uh, and then you go to something like uh, like Midgar it's like completely fantasy world you know so it's kind of all over the place but uh, but again it's fun you know uh, so now I'm on a third piece here now we're gonna be wrapping up pretty quick uh, here man hopefully I can get this uploaded by the end of today so you guys can see this before Friday uh, right now it's my time Thursday 7 p.m. in Singapore that makes it about you guys uh, Wednesday somewhere in the a.m. so I'll try to get this up soon do 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 and when I get this uploaded, we'll try to get the group thing going on Draw Crowd hopefully soon. And then, yeah, that'll be pretty fun. I look forward to uh, interacting with you guys because that's the whole point why we made that website is to have a friendly community of of uh, of just artists of all different skill levels putting up you know your drawings and sharing with each other. So there's no pressure. You know, we want a, a place to to be light hearted. I guess is the way uh, we want to design that site. So uh, to encourage you know even if you're like. 10 years old, you know, 12 years old, you're drawing something, upload it, share, you know, make friends, um, you know, see see what other guys are doing uh, without the pressure of, or peer pressure, I guess, like, oh, you have to be a badass artist to uh, to show off your work or so. So, um, yeah, so with Design Cinema, that's something I want to get into uh, in the later episode as well, in which we pick really fun projects. And it's not about the quality of the art, but more about, like, let's get everyone to draw. You know, do you like to draw? Have you never drawn before? Or uh, maybe you always like to draw, but you haven't done it for years? Well, let's get together and just do this. You know, who cares? Let's, it's about the experience, about uh, picking that brush and make yourself happy that you, you drew something. You know, it's not about like, oh man, my stuff doesn't look as good as the dude next to me, so I'm get all depressed. Don't care about that kind of stuff. Enjoy what you do, and that's gonna offer you so much more reward than to do it for somebody else. Okay, so all right, back to this. You can see the black frame is now turned off. You can see all nine paintings presented in their kind of one layer state, and I, I love this look. I, it looks like old school. Um, comp paintings you see back in the days you know when they were done on on, on real canvas boards and it pretty much takes that look when you take the uh, 
the uh, what you call it, the masking tape off, some of the edges will bleed off. The paint will actually run into the tape, and you'll see these little streaks and stuff. And it creates a very similar effect. And I just love seeing that kind of stuff when students, uh, were actually ourselves, who are the students, when we present this in a classroom with traditional media, you see this runoff in the paint, and it just has a nice human touch to it. Um, so. Yeah, give this a try. Um, all right, so this episode is uh, coming to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, again, I apologize tremendously for the inexcusable delay. That is just way too long <laughs> between two episodes. It's like not professional at all. So uh, send me mail. Just go, fan, you freaking lazy bastard. Do a new episode ready, okay? So get mad at me, man. Just yell at me and stuff like that. So that way I'll get off my butt and uh, produce more episodes for you guys because I love doing it. So anyways, thank you guys so much for being patient and leaving all these messages uh, on, on YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, next week, let's just say for sure, okay, let's just for sure. I'm 90% sure I'll get part two of Final Fantasy VII. Let's draw on to YouTube by next week. So until then, um, been a fun episode. I hope you guys enjoyed these designs and this new approach as well with these comps. And uh, show me what you guys got. Send some links, uh, you know, post on our website, whatever you want to do. And uh, I will see you guys in one week, okay? So until then, uh, go pick up the Final Fantasy VII if you haven't played it, okay? So for the rest of you, maybe play it again. Maybe I'll go back and play it this week uh, while we uh, while we wait for the next episode. All right, guys. So thank you so much once again, and I will see you guys next week, okay?